Suddenly, here's a quiz. What are the solutions to the equation x squared equals 1? That's right, the answer is positive or negative 1. Maybe that was a bit too easy. Then, what are the solutions to x squared equals negative 1? Within the real numbers, there are no solutions. But in the complex numbers, the answer is positive or negative i. Lastly, what are the solutions to x squared equals 0? The only x that satisfies this is 0. Whoa! What's this? This is a dual number. Midden, what's gotten into you all of a sudden? This epsilon squared equals zero, but it says epsilon is not zero. I don't really get it, but something's starting. The only number that squares to zero is zero, so this epsilon shouldn't exist. You're right, that's how we usually think. But what if we assume such an epsilon does exist? What are you talking about? This is quite similar to the story of introducing imaginary numbers. There's no real number whose square is negative one. But what if we assume such a number exists? And we came to represent such a number using i. I see, go on. In the same way, the only real number that squares to zero is zero. But what if such a number exists, besides zero? And we represent this mysterious number as epsilon? This is hard to accept. But it does sound very similar to when we introduced imaginary numbers. Please, continue. Just a quick note, when we define i as the imaginary unit, negative i also squares to negative 1. Well, yeah, since i squared comes out. Similarly, since epsilon squared equals 0, any constant multiple of epsilon will also square to 0. Here, let's assume c is a non-zero real number. I see, so c epsilon shares the same properties as epsilon. Now, to continue the story. Just like complex numbers are expressed as a plus b i using real numbers a and b, dual numbers are expressed as a plus b epsilon using real numbers a and b. I see. Dual numbers are kind of similar to complex numbers. I'm glad you're here, Medim. I wouldn't have understood anything on my own. No, from here on, it's up to you to unravel the mystery of dual numbers. I'm just your support. What? Really? Now I'm feeling a bit nervous. Don't worry, let's take it step by step. First, let's start with a simple dual number calculation. Try calculating this expression. This. This is. It's the addition of two dual numbers. But how should I do it? Basically, you can treat epsilon like a regular number. Just remember that epsilon squared equals zero. Got it. So, first, you add three and four to get seven. Then, you add 2 epsilon and negative epsilon to get epsilon. So the answer is 7 plus epsilon, right? Correct. We haven't seen anything particularly dual number-like in the calculation yet. How about this one? Hmm, I see. This time, it's dual number multiplication. Let's try expanding this expression. We can treat epsilon like a regular number, right? So first, multiply 3 by 4 to get 12. Then, multiply 3 by negative epsilon to get negative 3 epsilon. Similarly, you get 8 epsilon. And negative 2 epsilon squared as well. Now epsilon squared has appeared. Oh that's right. Since epsilon squared is 0, this term disappears. So the answer is this. Well done. That was a specific example, but in general, when you add two dual numbers, a1 plus b1 epsilon and a2 plus b2 epsilon, the result looks like this. Doesn't this look familiar? Now that you mention it, this is. It's similar to how you add real or imaginary parts in complex number addition. Exactly. Also, when you multiply two dual numbers, I'll skip the details, but the result looks like this. Here, we're just expanding the terms as usual. But the disappearance of the epsilon squared term is unique to dual number calculations. It disappears when squared. It's a strange feeling. Now, there's something important to keep in mind when working with dual numbers. What should it be? Before that, try calculating this expression. Ah, this is a complex number calculation, right? The reciprocal of the imaginary unit i, if I remember correctly. Multiply the numerator and denominator by i. And in the denominator, i squared equals negative 1. So the answer is negative i. So far, so good. Now, how about this expression? This is. 
The reciprocal of epsilon? I've never seen this, but I'll try the same method as before. Let's multiply the numerator and denominator by epsilon. Then in the denominator, epsilon squared, which equals zero, appears. Ah, wait. You can't divide by zero, right? Exactly. That's not allowed. This is the consequence of committing the forbidden act of dividing by epsilon. You mustn't divide by epsilon. That's an unexpected restriction. Let's think about this from a different perspective. Epsilon is a number that squares to zero. If we allow division by epsilon, we'd end up dividing both sides by epsilon, making epsilon equal zero. But epsilon was originally defined as a non-zero number. That's a contradiction. You can't divide by epsilon. This feels similar to how you can't divide by zero. However, this doesn't mean epsilon can't appear in the denominator. As long as the real card isn't zero, you can still divide. For example, let's consider the reciprocal of 1 plus epsilon. Since 1 is in the denominator here, the earlier issue won't arise. In fact, if you multiply the numerator and denominator by 1 minus epsilon, the denominator becomes 1 minus epsilon squared. And since epsilon squared disappears, the answer is 1 minus epsilon. Hmm, I see. But wait, what if? What do we do in a case like this? If we have b1 epsilon equals to b2 epsilon, with b1 and b2 as real numbers, we'd expect b1 equals b2, but, isn't this like dividing both sides by epsilon? Sharp observation. It does look like we're dividing both sides by epsilon, but here we're just comparing the coefficients of epsilon, so it's better to think of it as something different from division. Got it! Have we solved the mystery of dual numbers now? No, the world of dual numbers goes much deeper. Next, we're going to explore the geometry of dual numbers. The geometry of dual numbers? We're going to examine what shapes look like in the world of dual numbers. But jumping straight into dual numbers would be tough. So let's start by reviewing the complex plane, where we clock complex numbers. Um, Madam, weren't you supposed to be just support? It kind of feels like you're the main character now. Well, don't worry about it. Now, a complex number z equals x plus yi corresponds to a point on the xy plane like this. The absolute value of z, or the distance from the origin, can be calculated as the square root of x squared plus y squared. This can also be expressed using the complex conjugate z bar. If you calculate the inside of the square root, the complex conjugate of x plus yi is x minus yi, so it looks like this. And when you expand the expression, you get x squared equals negative 1 here. Therefore, the answer becomes x squared plus y squared, proving that the formula is correct. Now then, Zundemon. Ah, yes. In the case of dual numbers, how would this work? I don't know, but I guess I have no choice. I'll give it a try. Let's first consider the dual number z equals x plus y epsilon. If we plot this on the xy plane, does this look about right? That looks good. Can you calculate the absolute value of z using the same method as before? So this time, this expression defines the absolute value, right? Then, well, let's go ahead and calculate what's inside the square root. Just like in the complex case, let's consider the conjugate of the dual number x plus y epsilon to be x minus y epsilon. If you expand this expression, you get this. And since epsilon squared equals zero, the answer is just x squared. Ha! Huh. Why disappeared? Well, that's fine. So, if you plug this result into the formula for the absolute value of z, the answer is the absolute value of x. In other words, the absolute value of a dual number c is the absolute value of its real part. When calculating the absolute value, epsilon is ignored. This turned out to be a very interesting result. Like we saw earlier, epsilon seems to have properties similar to zero. It's like zero, but not exactly zero. Perhaps we could say that epsilon represents an infinitesimal. Alright, let's move on. Now, Zundemon. Based on what we've learned, can you draw the unit circle for dual numbers? The unit circle for dual numbers? Hmm. Let's start by thinking about the complex case. In the complex plane, the unit circle is the set of points that are a distance of 1 from the origin. 
In other words, it's the set of complex numbers with an absolute value of 1. So, what about dual numbers? For a dual number to have an absolute value of 1, the absolute value of the x-coordinate must be 1. So the x-coordinate must be either 1 or negative 1. In other words, these two lines combined form what we would call the unit circle for dual numbers. At this point, it doesn't really look like a circle anymore. This also turned out to be an interesting result. It seems like the geometry of dual numbers opens up a strange new world. By the way, what are dual numbers even useful for? What are you saying, Zundemon? But I guess I can understand why you'd feel that way. So, to finish up, let me introduce an important application of dual numbers. In fact, dual numbers are closely related to differentiation. What? Let's start with a simple example. Consider the function f of x equals x squared. If you differentiate this function normally, you get 2x. On the other hand, if you extend this function into the world of dual numbers, and calculate f of x plus epsilon minus f of x. This essentially means x plus epsilon squared minus x squared. And if you extend this expression, you get this. The x squared terms cancel out, and epsilon squared also disappears. So the answer is 2x epsilon. And you can rewrite this as f prime of x epsilon. Hmm, I see. It seems like dual numbers are related to differentiation. But isn't this just a coincidence? Let's generalize the discussion a bit. If we take n to be a natural number, what happens for f of x equals x to the n? Ah! When you differentiate x to the n, you get an x to to the n minus 1. So, f of x plus epsilon minus f of x is the same as x plus epsilon to the n minus x to the n. But how do we expand this again? Using the binomial theorem, the first two terms of x plus epsilon to the n look like this. What about the other terms? In the other terms, epsilon appears more than once, so they all become zero. I see. Then all that's left is to subtract x to the n. So you're left with just this. There's differentiation here too. It doesn't seem like this is just a coincidence. That's exactly right. The equality we just derived, in fact, can be extended to many well-behaved functions, including exponential and trigonometric functions. This is a known fact. Wow, really? We'd normally need a rigorous discussion about dual number functions and convergence, though. And if we switch the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this equality, you get an equality like this. Now, let's formally divide both sides by epsilon. As we confirmed earlier, you're not really supposed to divide by epsilon. But by doing so anyway, don't you notice something? This... This is... It looks similar to the definition of a derivative. Good observation. Yes, this closely resembles the formula for the definition of a derivative. In particular, epsilon corresponds to h in the derivative definition. And since we're thinking about the limit as h approaches zero here, in this sense too, we can think of epsilon as representing an infinitesimal. However, this equality has epsilon in the denominator. So in practice, use this other equality instead. I see, so that's what this formula meant. Dual numbers really are deep. Thank you, dual numbers. I probably won't use you, but take care. Please do use them. Looks like it's about time. Well then, take care everyone. See you again.